I'd like to introduce um, I'd like to introduce Vinay. Vinay is a Sydney-based writer and finance professional. He used to work at he started working at Westpac and then he became the head of private capital at um, the Commonwealth Bank. And then he worked at um, Rivercon Asset Management for a few years as a chief investment officer. He's also a screenwriter as well, who's written a book called The Frankenstein Candidate. And today, Vinay will be talking about um, the GFC, and it'll be quite a different interpretation of what caused the crisis than what you'll typically hear on the media. The media and mainstream economics economists tend to blame the, um, the lack of regulation, um, the free market, as the problems that led to excessive lending and borrowing. But Vinay will argue the opposite, that it was a lack of a free market and too much regulation, which, which actually caused it, rather than um, tried to stop it. So I'd like to introduce Vinay now. Um, thank you, Michael, for the very complimentary uh, introduction. Um, what we're going to talk about today, you may or may not have heard this interpretation. Um, because the popular media focuses on the interpretation that we'll just briefly go through very quickly in the beginning. Um, and so I'm not going to push this down your throat and try to convince you that this is the only way to look at things. I'm going to say, well, this is one way to look at it. And if you are serious about cultivating a critical mind, and keep, your, keep, keep an open mind, look at some of the recommended reading at the end of this presentation, and make up your own mind. That's where we're going. The popular media has blamed derivatives especially credit default derivatives, securitization, those greedy Wall Street bankers, they caused the global financial crisis. I will do a very quick experiment right now, right here. Okay. Here's Michael, there's Mark, um, there's, where's Jason? Jason's run away already. Okay. It's <laughs> cattle, isn't it? Okay. So Michael's a smart guy, right? What he's done, he's taken a, a wager, a bet with Mark, um, for just $10 saying it'll rain tomorrow. He says it'll rain, he says it won't rain. And then he takes a bet with Carol saying it won't rain. And he's kind of perfectly hedged. He doesn't matter whether it rains or it doesn't rain. He doesn't make any money. But then he gets greedy. He says, you know, this is good. They don't know each other. And he kind of leverages it up and he says $50,000. He's got money, he's got a rich dad, don't worry. So he says, $50,000 to Mark, if it rains, Mark's got to give him 50,000 bucks. If it doesn't rain, he's got to give Mark 49,000 bucks. And Mark says, hey, what a minute. And he says, oh, no, that's the probability of precipitation, is blah, 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 that's why they're not equal. And then he says to Carol, if it doesn't rain, he gets $49,000 from her. If it does rain, he gives her $50,000. So, so the, day, the next day comes and goes, we have some definition of rain, minimum precipitation of two millimeters or whatever. And he's set to get a thousand dollars profit no matter what happens. So he's perfectly hedged, he has his arbitrage. Uh, but there's one snag there. And the snag is, if it doesn't rain, Mark has to pay him. And Mark says, ha ha, yeah, I fool you, I don't have 50 grand. And he's got, because he had 50 grand, he's got to pay Carol now. But in this whole process, when we exchange $10 and when we exchange even $50,000, the total amount of cash in this room didn't change. Neither did if you had a certain amount of wealth in an economy. And by wealth, I mean um, assets, productive assets, even including ships and planes and machines. Nothing's been bombed out of existence. So wealth hasn't changed simply because people took bets with each other. That's what they are. Derivatives are wages on exogenous events. And they, yes, they can get very, very complex. You know, I put LTCM question mark there. 
and which is kind of wasn't quite counterparty credit risk in LTCM, but LTCM was long term capital management. And in 1998, the Federal Reserve of the US decided to have a meeting with all the bankers and LTCM and try and rescue LTCM. But the Fed didn't actually contribute to the rescue. And if no wealth can be lost by derivatives, why did they do it is the question. LTCM had some what they call convergence trades. So they would buy, for those of you who are familiar with finance, they'd buy a 30-year bond, treasury bond, which had been issued three months prior. So it was 29 years and nine months to go. They would short a 30-year bond, which had more liquidity, and then pick up the spread. They'd protect themselves from, like Michael had, from interest rate fluctuations, leverage it up. It was a 4.75 billion in equity. They had leverage of 125 billion on top of that. The total trades in notional amount were $1 trillion. So the Federal Reserve was scared because they were playing in government bond markets. They were scared because banks like Michael were on the counterparty side, so that if they wound up without paying, it would be the banks that would lose money. So the regulators are scared if banks lose money to hedge funds. But if hedge funds lose money, they're not scared. There's no, there's no diminution of wealth in the economy, but that's why they're scared. So just, let's just keep that in mind when we go toward the, toward the end. So that, that was a bit of a sidebar in that derivatives have taken the blame, but I think we can exonerate them from, and, and securitization as well, we can exonerate it from being the primary culprit for a massive failure in the economy. So now we are on to what really caused it. This was first enacted in 1977, modified in 1995 under Bill Clinton. Community Reinvestment Act. There was a little study done by the Boston Fed that said, you know, when these people come for home loans, Asians get better loans than, more, more, more often Asians get approved than whites, but whites get approved more than Hispanics or uh, African Americans or Hispanic Americans. And there was, as you can imagine, a lot of uproar. Then there was a subsequent study which said, if you, if you modify that for credit worthiness, the second part is not correct. But it was lost. The liberal media was on top of it. Bill Clinton and the whole lobby was on top of it. And they strengthened the Community Reinvestment Act. Um, they reinv reinvigorated the other credit acts. Um, Boston Fed pulled out a, you know, wrote a manual for the banks and exposed the banks to some very crushing discrimination lawsuits unless they were giving home loans to you know, the, the people who were missing out, the minorities, never mind their credit worthiness. Um, so that was a big stick for the banks. Uh, what happened then was we also needed a carrot. You know, the, the regulators were at the door, give, home, give more home loans to certain people. By the way, the fact that one minority, being the sort of Asian minority, was getting more home loans than whites because they were more credit worthy, where they were more regular in their payments, was lost obviously on the liberal media. Um, so there, you might have heard these names, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Um, well, Fannie is, it's called an association, but both Fannie and Freddie are corporatized entities. They're corporations that were owned by the government to start with, and then they were later privatized and now they sit under what they call conservatorship, which is nationalization. They're owned by the government again. And they didn't give mortgages directly, but they, what banks were able to do is to write the mortgage and sell it to Fannie or Freddie. So the banks had a little party going on. Their capital wasn't running out. They could keep on writing mortgages. Either sell, generally they didn't sell individual mortgages. They bundled them up called it a CDO, sold the CDO securities to Fannie and Freddie. And Fannie and Freddie too, the investment banks were helping them securitize their mortgages as well. And so they weren't running out of capital. They had a two and a quarter billion line of credit from Treasury. They were listed on the stock exchange. So seemingly there was just infinite capital to go around. 
And the New York Times was writing an article exhorting people, go and buy a home. It's the American dream. There's a case study of a guy who was a student making 17000 a year, mid-twenties, was married. There's no right. He shouldn't have got a loan in the kind of suburb he did. He did. And when the collapse came, after the collapse, they said from 1995 to 2008 of the new mortgages, Fannie and Freddie had a hand in 75% of them. Half of the mortgages, they had a, when I say they had a hand in, they weren't still in their balance sheet because some of them was kind of, they had gone through Fannie and Freddie and then been sold to some Norwegian fund, up, you know, like a, or an Australian superannuation fund or something like that. But Fannie and Freddie had facilitated that many mortgages. They also said Fannie was, excuse the French, sucking up to Bill Clinton. Well, turns out that Fannie Mae um, made a lot of campaign contributions to Bill Clinton as well. So now the banks were really in a good position, right? They're making fees from originating mortgages, and if they didn't originate, they had a stick over them. Meanwhile, they could sell the mortgages, make a lot of money, and making a lot of fees. Fannie and Freddie are making a lot of money as well. Um, the only thing that was needed to ignite this party was the central bank, and they got into the act. Um, you sort of often hear that the central bank lowered interest rates. That's the sort of popular thing that the media reports. And what actually happens is that it's, it's not that straightforward that someone writes on the blackboard, well, we'll make this 3 and a quarter percent 3%. I mean, there is a refinancing rate with the banks that they can just change pretty much like that. But the other thing they do is they go into the market and with their authorized dealers, they put a, put a lot of demand for treasuries with money they don't really have. They just create the money out of thin air, write it as an accounting entry and say basically to their authorized dealers, which will be big banks, over here, the CBAs, the West Packs, over there, the, the JP Morgans, the... Goldman Sachs, they're all authorized money market dealers uh, and treasury dealers. And there's a little bit of an auction, a little bit of a competition in terms of getting it at the best possible yield. But once the bank knows that the Fed is going to buy the treasuries off them at a certain price, then they go out in the market and buy them. So in effect, there is a greater demand. Greater demand means bigger price. And in a bond instrument, as you know, bigger price means a lesser yield. To maturity. Does that make sense? Yeah. So once that party began, um, they, I was just going to sort of do a, like a little diversion into the Austrian theory of business cycles. So there's a school of economics that is simply often just not taught. I mean, I did a master's in finance at New South Wales, and Austrian school was never even mentioned. I mentioned the classical, the neoclassical, the Keynesian, the neo-Keynesian, the monetarist. But nobody talks as if, it, as if it doesn't exist, as if it has no kind of scientific validity, it's kind of witchcraft, or it's just not worth taking seriously as the attitude of the mainstream economists. The Austrian theory is that if you have these sort of consumer fetishes, like home lending, or, you know, fed by the government, money gets channeled into consumer items. And re the resources of an economy are limited. You cannot cheat nature. You cannot cheat reality. You cannot create assets out of thin air. So if you pour money into the national broadband network, as Kevin Rudd wanted us to do, there's some other jobs that don't happen. There's some other projects that don't happen. And you never hear about them. It's called the broken window fallacy. And um, there's an argument as to why it's called the broken window, which I won't go into right now. But any time you hear a politician saying, I'm going to create this new road, new cancer hospital, new whatever, they can print money and do it, or they can borrow money and do it, or what they do is some other project won't happen because they're doing it. If they're printing money and doing it, everything else is going to become more expensive eventually. If they're borrowing money and doing it, at some stage or the other, the borrowing will have to be returned, so it's borrowed from future generations. So the older generation is literally borrowing money from the younger generation like you. So even um, one of the Fed board members, his name is Thomas Honig, if you go through the minutes of the Federal Reserve minute, uh, meetings, Honig always dissents. 
he says, no, we shouldn't be doing this. Yet today, he's sitting on the board of the FDIC, which is an insurance company that guarantees bank deposits. His salary is twice that of Ben Bernanke's. Um, Bernanke gets just under 200000 a year. Uh, our APRA chief gets a million a year. But the real, um, the sort of, the real attraction of that Federal Reserve Chief job is once Bernanke finishes in 2014, he'll be the after-dinner speaker everywhere and anywhere and, and pretty much draw you know, 10000 for one, one speech, that sort of money, consultant to the government. He'll go on to K Street, become a lobbyist, earn millions quite easily, quite easily. So that, that's the, one of the big attractions of becoming the Fed Chief. Um, Old Driscoll was a Fed official who said the Fed is like the arsonist. So they've set the fire, they really got the fire going by pumping money into the economy and then they watch, oh my god, I can't believe I did this, this kind of thing. Um, in addition to that, there's a lot of legal dis distortions in the economy. I mean, this is happening here as well. We get this um, first home buyer scheme, um, free land, new roads, this is happening here. Wayne Swan, right now, here and today, has a scheme of building extra housing. It's called emergency housing scheme or something like that. Extra housing for people who work in emergency services. Um, so at the moment, it's fairly limited. And you'd say, well, isn't it a bad, is it a bad idea to give policemen and nurses some kind of cheaper housing? Well, yes and no. Why don't they just raise their salary or something? Um, because you could have some policemen or some nurses who are married to surgeons and don't need that cheap rental. Um, the additional problem in the US, which still is the home mortgage interest deduction, um, is tax deductible. And for many middle class families, it's the largest deduction there is. So unfortunately, even um, George Bush, who's Republican, was also on the same bandwagon as Clinton buy a home loan now. He persuaded the regulators to try and get the down payment to zero. So you get a 100% loan if you have no job, practically no income. And house prices in the United States were rising continuously from 1998 till 2006. So you've got to ask the question, why did the bubble not burst earlier? And while the Fed was pumping money and the house prices were rising, there were a lot of borrowers who couldn't pay because they didn't have a job, they didn't have income, they couldn't pay their interest a couple of years later. Part of the problem was there were lots of adjustable rate mortgages that we see here. The first year the rate is 1%, next year it's 5 When it's 1, they can pay. Next year when it's 5 they find the house has gone up 20%, because that's how fast prices are going up. So they flip the house. They either refinance and get it down to 1% again, or they sell it, they actually make a capital gain for not being able to make their interest payments. The bank's happy, they got their money back, start all over again. It's like, it keeps escalating. Obviously, at some stage, and we feed it this in our little island economy, Michael was the banker, then at some stage, and if we sort of persuaded everyone, build more huts, build more huts, for some of us got to go and hunt for food, right? So, okay, instead of 10 out of 100 people um, doing huts for everyone, we'll have 50 out of 100 people doing huts. Soon, we'll have too many huts. It's just the law of nature. And we'll have insufficient medical care, we'll probably have insufficient food, we'll have insufficient everything else. So that's exactly what happened. There were just too many houses. And the house prices have to collapse. Um, but that in itself doesn't explain why there was a credit crisis. The credit crisis is explained as follows. Even though the banks were selling the mortgages off, typically when you do a mortgage, you couldn't just sell it off. They were sold in what we call CDOs, credit default obligations. So you had to keep writing new mortgages for about six months, build it up, build it up till it was three, four hundred million dollars. Five hundred was the ideal number. By the time you had a hundred, you were going to the rating agencies and trying to structure it. And then why, when the package was finally ready, you would contact some investment banks, you would go to Fannie and Freddie, eventually sell it off. So anytime the party stops, anytime the music stops, you have something left over in your balance sheet. All those things that were, you know, the sausage was being prepared before it was sold. So they did kind of get caught with their pants down. They had some left over there. Fannie and Freddie had a lot left over there. 
Some of the CDOs were sold with the, what we call the bottom tranche of the CDO. It was unrated, could not be sold, so they took the, the, the worst kind of risk that, uh, that can be taken. And at the same time, these banks are extremely poorly capitalized. I mean, you would, if you were an analyst for BHP, and you said, it's okay for BHP to have 2% equity capital and 98% debt, you'd be laughed off the room. And you'd think, oh, well, Basel III, Basel III has increased the equity requirement for banks from 2 like pure equity capital, to 4.5%. I mean, if you said that for Woolworths, IBM, or anything other than a bank, you'd be laughed off. It just doesn't work. You know, most companies would operate between 40 to 60% leverage. Only banks operate with 90 to 95% leverage. The slither of equity supporting everything is very, very thin. And again, there is a reason for that being the central bank wants them to be that way so they can kind of use their what we call money multiplier. I'll come to that later on, but the problem of having such little equity buffer is that when there are problems like they were, most of them were insolvent very quickly. And the danger was that nobody knew who was insolvent. So Citibank wouldn't trade with JP Morgan, JP Morgan wouldn't trade with Merrill Lynch and so on. Um, and that's why the interbank market froze because there's an enormous amount of activity every day on the interbank market. A lot is dealt with on the overnight settlements, in swaps, in derivatives, in government securities, buying and selling going on all the time. And it is on credit, sometimes on 90 days credit, two days credit. Now, if you don't know, Mark's going to default, you don't want to take a 50 grand debt and bet with him. So when that problem arose, in October 2008, um, the candidates at the time, John McCain, Barack Obama, were summoned to the White House by George W. Bush. He said, I don't know what to do. What do you guys want to do? You agree something. McCain just sat on the fence the whole time. Obama said, I'll support this. This has got to be done. Because he didn't want to, he thought that stimulus would rescue the economy. He didn't want to inherit a, a bad economy. Um, the bailout, first time, wasn't passed. The Republicans opposed it. Because McCain was still sitting on the fence, they said, you're our leader, you tell us, what are you going to do? And then we'll follow you. And then eventually it was passed, unfortunately. Um, Henry Paulson, uh, ex-chief of Goldman Sachs, was Treasury Secretary, he summoned, uh, he had a lot, a lot of rescue meetings. Um, there's, a, there's a story which is not on the slide about one of those rescue meetings. Lehman Brothers, their chairman, Richard Fold, he got something like $300 million payouts, or even more. He was in Asia and he was summoned to a meeting in, uh, in Washington, D.C. Um, and he, he had his private jet plane. And the first thing he said was, um, if you want me to get there quickly, can I fly over Russia? And they said, no, you can't fly over Russia. There's no flies on there. So he, he wanted the government, even then, this company of 135 years possibly going down the drain, he wanted the government to grant him a favor. He wanted Treasury to contact Department of Defense to get permission from the Russians so his plane could fly over Russian airspace. Now, thankfully, they said no to that, but there's a lot, a lot of cronyism going on, or what's going on. Uh, inevitably, this part of it, you know, uh, Bear Stearns was sort of bailed out. The creditors were bailed out, really. Um, equity shares in Bear Stearns went from $150 to $2 in, in a matter of days. Um, so the equity holders lost a lot of money. Um, AIG was rescued. So it was a bit of a lottery. Who's going to get rescued? Who's going to get bailed out? Who's going to go to ground? Lehman's went to ground. Ironically, Lehman's went to ground, went to Chapter 11 bankruptcy, and some of its divisions which were purchased by Nomura and others have eventually been turned around into profitable entities. So if you let the market work, things will be set right. Which is, if you heard the speech today, uh, the debate today between Romney and Obama, there was a comment about the auto bailout. And Romney's comment was, well, with the auto industry, let it go through a chapter 11. It'll come out and start functioning again. Keep them operating, as against bailing them out for credit. Um, Bush was called Comrade. 
Comrade Bush is to the left of me now is a famous phrase. Um, but since then, if with all this stimulus, the economy, neither the global nor the US, has recovered. And what's happened is the Federal Reserve is buying, still buying treasuries. The interest rates are going further and further down. Uh, they're also buying mortgages. And there's new provisions on, on the Act now. And some of the new provisions are very, very um, uh, startling. Uh, one of them is called the Homeowners Lending Scheme, in which what happens is, if you are deemed to be sufficiently poor, then your mortgage can be halved. So if you're a husband and wife team, and your aggregate income is $65,000, you don't qualify. But you say to your wife, you know what? Can you quit your job and then take it again in three months' time? Or wife might say that to the husband. Can you quit a job, get it back in three months' time? Can you negotiate that? If you can, we can show our income is below 35000 Cut our mortgage in half. Why pay? Even today, this is happening. Um, if you're really poor, you can walk away without any even a delinquency score on your credit sheet. So it's, it's still going on. The Federal Reserve is buying mortgages, which is very, very dangerous. I mean, they've already got suspected to have got already $5 trillion of treasuries, as in debt issued by the US government. And then on top of that, they're propping up assets. Um, the FDIC is a separate body in the US, the Federal Deposit Insurance Commission. They're dealing at the moment um, with four to five bank failures every month. Um, go to www.fdic.gov, don't take my word for it, look at the past 18 months, four to five bank failures every month. Um, August was a good month, September was a good month, July was eight failures. Uh, they don't call them failures, just read between the lines. They say, oh, these bank's deposits were taken over by some other bank. Um, so they got pushed into that. Uh, 92 failures. I mean, it is under the heading failures. So they're, not, they're not being too coy about it. 92 failures in 2011. Yeah. That's about seven or eight a month. So we, we then come to what we probably haven't heard. What is... Why does this happen? Why did the Great Depression happen? Why was there a recession um, uh, in 1991 and so on and so forth? And uh, here in Australia as well. And not only Austrian, but even classical theory says, essentially government creates distortions. And the minute the government creates distortions, it channels production into places where the consumer demand doesn't exist. Uh, you can do it by regulation, by tax breaks, price fixing, subsidies, penalties, all that sort of thing. At the same time, you have this bank, which is like Reserve Bank of Australia, APRA, Bank of England, Federal Reserve, whatever they're called. And they've got this very holy kind of presence in our economy. Nobody, no mainstream journalist ever takes them on, other than by saying, oh, maybe they should have you know, shouldn't have reduced interest rates by a quarter percent or something. But in effect, they're nothing but counterfeiters. I mean, if every one of us had a printing press, we'd just print money and we'd, we think we'd all be rich, but in effect, everyone will be poor. Because you cannot create more goods and services by printing money. So if everybody got a million dollars stash in front of their house tomorrow, because Ben Baden came in around in a helicopter and dropped a million bucks like that, or the, everybody gets a million bucks, all the prices would go up and none of us would be better off. It's, it's, um, so there's all this manipulation of money supply, the bastardization of interest rates, and it's not called that. It's just called something else. It's euphemistically called monetary policy or fiscal policy. It isn't policy. Um, so the, the question then we have to ask is why? Why do they do this? What's in it for them? And we'll get that to the, into the next slide as to what's in it for them. But just before we jump onto that, um, the talk going around right now is there should be more regulation. And everything that happened with the banks were so unregulated and the Wall Street greed and so on and so forth. And we had a Glass-Steagall Act in the US for something like 66 years which separated investment and commercial banking. Maybe that act should come back. But frankly, both commercial and investment banks took the bait. It was too tempting. 
there was a carrot and the stick. They all went down together. So that doesn't work. Um, Sarbanes-Oxy is another regulation that reportedly had three and a half million dollars of regulatory cost. Now, here's the clue um, to those FDIC failures that you see. Small banks that have about 100 to 300 million dollars in deposits are the ones that are failing. And they're failing because the regulatory cost is a fixed cost. If you have to do a lot of reports and it costs you three million dollars every year to do them, who do you think can easily afford it? JP Morgan or the little credit society? If it's the same cost, it's not proportional to your deposit base. The little bank can't afford it. I mean, three million is like the entire net revenue. That's how they exist. So they're gone. Um, there's Basel III, and this is an interesting thing. Basel III is now trying to substantially increase. It's still going to be absolutely insufficient, but they're going to substantially increase the capital requirements from something like eight, what they call capital, which includes tier one, tier two, um, not pure equity. We spoke about that 2% going to four and a half before with mandatory buffers and all that. It still, it still doesn't meet this sort of smell standard. You still would not take somebody like a Woolworth CFO seriously if they said, well, we're going to increase our capital to 15% or 85% debt. No way. Just wouldn't work. Won't be able to list you. In, in Singapore, you cannot list a company which has debt more than 50%. Um, this is the beauty. Dodd-Frank, did you hear the, um, the first debate between Romney and Obama? And in which Romney said, I support Dodd-Frank too. I mean, that's a terrible thing to say. But I don't like the too big to fail provision. Um, the Dodd-Frank Act is the longest piece of financial legislation ever enacted on earth. 2,300 pages long. Um, if some of you are doing law, I mean, there are 16 titles. Um, it's a nightmare, except for certain kind of people. It's not a nightmare for the attorneys. And it's not a nightmare for K Street. Um, K Street is a metronym. The, even today, the 20 largest lobbying firms in the US are headquartered on K Street. It's like Hollywood. So Hollywood is kind of funny now because you know, Universal Studios, Warner Brothers, all moved out of Hollywood into Culver City and different places. Top 20 lobbying firms still on K Street North End. So K Street means the lobbying firms, they thrilled. They recruit former bureaucrats on salaries of between one to two million dollars a year base salary and they get bonuses on top of that. Um, why? They lobby the government and what happens? Nothing new is ever created out of that lobbying. The lobbying is simply, oh, let's grab this and put it into here. Work for this constituency. It's always Peter Ra robbing Paul. I mean, imagine, for instance, the government said something like that explicitly. All of you can have a free education. No hex. Isn't that beautiful? We'll do that just for New South Wales. You'll say, yeah, great, fantastic. And this is the way we're going to pay for it. Um, Victorian motorists will have a new tax. We'll call the Victorian motorist tax. So every time they drive on the road, they've got to pay more regist radio fees and all that sort of thing. We'll collect it from Victoria and spend it on you guys. Everyone here is going, yeah, no hex, beauty. Obviously, it won't go down so well in Victoria. So if it is very explicit where the cost is, and all that a lobbying firm ever does is takes it from somewhere, puts it into something else. But where you take it from, they, those people are not told about it. So they're laughing now. There's another rule called the Walker rule. That won't work either. Prohibiting the banks from owning a hedge fund, investing in a hedge fund. Frankly, the hedge funds made, some of them made quite a lot of money on this credit crisis because they called it right, Paulson and Company. So if some of the banks had ownership or investment in the hedge fund, they probably would have done much better than what they actually did. So that's one alternative. Or you dismantle this whole structure of fiat money central banking, so no Reserve Bank of Australia, no APRA, no Federal Reserve, free banking. Um, it's a concept you'll have to read up on. Um, and you remove the government from the economy. And it's, um, there's a question we asked, which I'm going to come to in the last slides, just the second last, as to why people do it. And we've got to really understand why. Part of the reason is that some politicians actually are completely misguided in, in that they, they really want to serve the public interest and they really think 
that this sort of thing works, this pumping the economy with <coughs> false money and all that sort of thing. And that theory is credited to a gentleman by the name of John Maynard Keynes, um, whom the, I'll give you the Austrian version of Keynes. The Austrian version of Keynes is, in this book, Keynes is demolished and his quack system refuted. Um, the book is uh, Where Keynes Went Wrong and it lists 12 generic errors that Keynes periodically has in his book. Generic errors like device 1, obscurity. Device 2, misuse of technical language. Device 3, shifting definition. So it's not 12 errors, 12 genes of errors. Um, and yet that is gospel in not only your economics course here, but pretty much all over the world. And so you get all these trained economists who then advise the government. Some point in time, some of them discover that they've been doing the wrong thing all the time, and they have a, you know, I don't know, they commit suicide or something, or they go take another job. They just carry on. Heaven knows, was break down when they are 64, or whatever. So they, they, this, this is the big fallacy. The economic range should be in the hands of experts. That is, that was Keynes's real motivation. He was a very Cultured guy, very clever, he was a mathematician, but in terms of economics, he let his emotions rule the roost. He wanted a certain outcome. He wanted to be surrounded, and his biographer notes that too, he wanted to be surrounded by admiring people, where he could be the chief. Like, if you take a philosophy course, one of the reasons Plato was killed, is Plato said to the king, philosophers should be kings. So, again, he had to take hemlock, because... That's not what the king wanted. But that's what Keynes wanted. He wants to be in the center of things. And that's his motivation. Um, as to gold being a barbarous relic, in 1913, um, the Federal Reserve was established. Uh, APRA became effective as RVA pretty much, pretty close to just after that. Although the act wasn't passed until much later because Treasury took over the financing. Since that time until now, the US dollar has lost over 95% of its purchasing power. Um, so if you're still in that kind of era, you'd probably buy a hamburger for a few cents. The Aussie dollars have done exactly the same, over 95% loss. Gold has appreciated. Um, so I'm not sure gold is a barbarous relic, or is it Keynesianism was a barbarous relic. Keynes, I mean, he, uh, I just want to speak ill of a dead man, he died in 1946. But I think it's Keynesianism which is more the barbarous relic. That was one of his famous things, the paradox of thrift, which means that if you save, then, um, and if everybody saves when things are bad, the economy goes down. It just doesn't work. There is no, there is no paradox. And we'll, we'll, we'll just disprove Keynesianism right now, right here, very quickly. Okay? Um, this is the example I'm using, macro magic. Um, the U.S. has... Give or take $3 trillion today in its budget as expenses, $2 trillion in income. A trillion dollar deficit during the Obama years. Right? Over 20 million people unemployed. Uh, what do we do? Keynes said, if you have nothing to do, let them dig holes. This is a true quote from Keynes. Let them dig holes and fill them up again. We'll just make work. All right, well, let's just make work. Pay them $25 an hour, 40, 40 hours a week. That's what, 1,000 thousand a week? 52,000 a year, 52 times... 20 million, um, so 1,000 times millions, a billion, 50 times 20 gives me another 1,000, that's a trillion. The U.S. economy is 14 trillion in GDP, so wow, we got a 7% growth, man, you know, rivaling China, unemployment down to zero. Why don't they do that? And the reason is, at the bottom of their heart, some of them know that this sort of make work nonsense simply doesn't work. I mean, this is an extreme example where you dig holes and fill them up again. But let's take the Australian example of the National Broadband Network. If you want to find how much money the government has wasted on your behalf, do the following. Stay the National Broadband Network and strip away all the special privileges that have been given to it. Because that transfers wealth from Hutchison, Vampoa, Telstra, Optus and all the rest to NBN. So strip that away float it or sell it in an auction, it will definitely sell for a fraction of how much of the money they've already spent. It won't sell for zero because there is broadband cable in the ground. Um, 
there is the optic fiber, there is design, there is some value, it's just not equal to what was meant. And the reason is simple, because Kevin Rudd doesn't know and he could not have possibly known what is the best for Australians. Let the market work it out. And if the market gets it wrong, so be it. They're the ones who lose money, it's not taxpayers' money. So long as it's taxpayers' money, these, these guys just keep doing that. Um, one more example at an individual level. Um, let's say you have a certain amount of wealth and you put one third of your wealth into the shares of a company that just goes bust overnight like ABC Learning or something. What is your wealth then worth? It's you've lost basically one third of the wealth off your wealth. There's no other way to look at it. On the other hand, if you invest one third of your wealth and it happens to be a 10 bagger, do you, do you know what a 10 bagger is? It's Peter Lynch term, which a share that goes up 10 times, not 10%, 10 times. So a third of it goes up 10 times, so what is that? 33.3% goes 333. Assume the remaining 66.7, say 67 stays the same, you got a total of 400, your wealth quadruples. So if you make smart investments, your wealth goes up. And it's the same with the economy. If the economy makes smart investments, the economy flourishes. And to make an investment, you have to have saving. You can't trick the economy and trick the consumption cycle by starting at the consumption end, in a real sense. In an accounting sense, you can. Because, you know, in first year economics, GDP is the sum of private uh, consumption, private investment, Government expenditure plus exports minus imports. So there's our trick. GDP up by trillion dollars. Just spend. Government spends in China. Not as bad as digging up holes and filling them up, but some of their projects are huge public sector projects that may not, like NBN, have the same value um, as would be ascribed by the market. So some of that 7 or 8 percent growth you got to take with a pinch of salt. Some of it is true. Um, so that, that's, that's so much common sense. There's no black magic. Yet, when you read Keynes and macroeconomics, the normal textbooks, they're all like black magic. Um, well, uh, quite a lot of it is like black magic. Uh, that's, um, I'm just going to jump to the conclusion after the reading. Um, and the reason um, is I, I wanted to alert you to a couple of things. One is uh, Mises.org. It's a tremendous site for anyone trying to understand this. A lot of economics is just simple common sense. Nothing more than an average intelligence required. You're all university students, some of you are honor students. You would get through that quite easily. Some of the books are complex and technical. Some of the essays are very, very simple. Um, I, in the second, in the last slide, I do give you my email address, and I think you are probably Michael, so um, you can take a snap of that, but um, uh, you can also get a copy of the presentation, whoever wants it. So I've actually lined them up in ease. The Mises Seminar is something that the Liberty Australia Institute organizes here. It's on the 1st and 2nd of December. I don't think that is free, but there may be a student discount. Check with Michael and Mark if there is. Um, Peter Schiff's book is very, very simple. I mean, he, he starts out with like an island economy, two people, and they will both catch one fish a day. So the economy is never going because they need one fish a day to survive. Until s one guy starts working harder and harder, catches two fish a day, and then spends his spare time building a net, capital, saving capital. Once he gets a net, bang, he's catching 20 fish a day. Wow, the economy booms. Now everyone's got spare time. Now you can do something else. You can build hearts, you can do some machines. Saving, he saves his time. Invest, smart investment, building a net. If it's a bad investment, you're back to square one. If we all went on an island, built a boat to get out of the island, there was a storm, the boat was destroyed, we're back to square one. The investment's got to be good. If the investment's good, more production. Production pays for itself. That says law in the sense that if you produce something in the act of producing things, people get money that they then can spend on the goods that are produced in aggregate. And it works. Um, 
Capitalism, the Unknown Ideal Series of Essays that were written in the 60s is a brilliantly written book. I mean, Ayn Rand is nothing short of a hypnotically brilliant writer. And I apologize for putting me into that sort of, um, kind of very high caliber of writers, but uh, this is just Frankenstein Canada is a novel that helps you understand the how the political mind works. Because I think by now you all know where I'm headed with this, the primary culprit is other politicians. Uh, Meltdown's also very wonderful book, reads lucidly and quite, quite easily. And then we get into sort of books that are a little bit more complex. Again, not too much so. If you're studying economics, you wouldn't find these hard at all. Uh, Henry Hazlitt was a polymath. Uh, you know, a polymath is someone who was a genius in many, many spheres, like Leonardo da Vinci. He never went to university, but Many, if he wasn't writing the anti-government stuff or the, the sort of the, um, the, the unconventional stuff, not so anti-government, then he should have been given honorary PhDs by many universities. Frankly, he is absolutely brilliant. Um, so is George Reisman. Murray. Chris Leithner is uh, a Canadian guy who lives in Brisbane, and uh, his focus is quite a lot on Australia. So that you might find that interesting. That book is on Kindle under ten dollars. Um, but visit Mises.org because every book that is available on Amazon, I find it's cheap, is available either cheaper in Mises.org or you can get it for free in a PDF format because they want to spread the word. Um, so now we come to our conclusion as to, well, why is this happening? Why are they lying to us? And so the question is, some, if somebody committed a murder and you are the homicide detective, who is kind of a very obvious answer, who has the most incentive to throw you off the track? If the scene of the crime was not cordoned off and isolated, who has the maximum incentive to throw some oil rag and some torn shirt with the wrong DNA in there? I mean, it's pretty obvious the murderer does. The politicians don't want you to know this. And they control education, and so they teach us the wrong things. I know it sounds conspira conspiratorial, and I'm not a cons conspiracy theorist, but the conclusion for me, at least, was inescapable. I think it is for Michael and Mark as well. But you make up your own mind. The most important thing right now is to develop a very, very critical mind. Don't accept what the mainstream media tells you. Don't even take you know, Mises' word for it, and definitely don't take my word for it, and Mark's word for it. Develop a critical thinking f faculty, make it more critical, read, make up your own mind. Um, so if you're looking at a murder, who murdered the economy, what was the motive? Why would politicians do that? Because the problem has become too difficult to manage. You cannot set the economy right without going through a depression now. It wouldn't last that long. I mean, one of the comments Mises made of Keynes was that everything that Keynes said was wrong. Everything, except for one statement. And the statement that is attributed to Keynes is, in the long run, we are all dead. A kind of true statement. I actually think even that statement is wrong. Because the context in which Keynes said it was as follows. The context was, there is a depression now. If we wait for the market to correct, in the long run, we'd be all dead. That is wrong. And the reason? The market self-corrects between one to three years. In 1921, there was a depression that lasted for only a year because the government let the market self-correct. In 1929, Hoover followed the stimulus and Roosevelt made it worse. And the result was we had an extended depression for about eight years. So, one to three years, if that's all it takes for the market to self-correct, that is not that long a run. I'd expect everybody in this room to be alive in three years. In the long run, if that's the long run, the three years out of the one to three, I hope we're not all dead. I hope none of us are dead in three years. Um, so why, why again do the politicians do it? One, and as far as the US and Australia are concerned, they can keep on issuing debt. Keep on postponing the problem. Keep on kicking the can down the road. Because whoever picks up the can is going to lose the election. That's their belief. 
some of them honestly believe, mistakenly, that stimulus programs work. And that's our conclusion. Um, it's certainly, we're not saying uh, we can absolve K Street, the lobbyists, and Wall Street of any blame. Central bankers definitely, you know, number two in the culprit list because they ought to know better. Keynesians, yes, of course. But they're kind of secondary to the fact that if the politicians understood and were committed to a free economy, they can dismantle the Federal Reserve. They can dismantle APRA. They can dismantle central banking. They can dismantle lobbying. By well, making it a free market, lobbying business would go out of business. Because then there would be, you know, the, the government would have no power to grant favors. If the government has no power to grant favors, why would you employ an ex-politician for a million dollars a year to get access to some politician where you can ask for favors? They would have no legal power in a free economy to grant favors. Um, that's pretty much all I had. Uh, I think we can exonerate securitization, just bundling things into securities, risk taking, private equity, hedge funds, all the usual things that are blamed from murdering the economy. Um, unfortunately, I think the way things are looking, um, they, they're looking pretty bad actually, uh, in terms of where, where the world economy is headed. I, I hope you know, the right thing happens by the time we graduate, but it may not happen. But uh, in any event, thank you for listening and paying attention. Um, and I'd like to thank Michael Kong uh, for organizing this as well as Liberty Australia and the unit and also the Sydney University for providing a forum in which we criticize what they teach you, which is great, you know, freedom of expression. <laughs> freedom of expression is still alive. They are not called First Amendment here, but thankfully uh, that's still going. Thanks a lot. Thank you everybody for attending today. We're going to have a short Q&A session right now. So if anybody has any questions, just oh, yes, feel free to ask. Oh, sorry about that. I forgot about that question. It's going to escape. No questions. Can't be right. Was this, um, let me ask a question. Since nobody has a question, I'll ask a question. Um, hands up for, for whom this was something somewhat new that you hadn't heard, at least part of it you hadn't heard before. So I know Marx heard it, or maybe not, maybe there was something you heard. For whom was it something new that you hadn't heard before? Okay, one, two, three, four. Okay, more than half, so sort of hesitant hands. So the rest of you knew this all, you'd heard this before. And you haven't bothered to check it out whether it's true or not, or you already agree. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, go to Mises.org uh, and, and look at some of these books. Make up your own mind. Okay. Um, any other question? Yeah. Do you believe in market failure? Um, uh, can you define market failure? I mean, like, you've said how the prior culturalist politicians were market can fix itself within one year or three year max, but what if it doesn't? You know, what if there is a case where it doesn't fix itself? Well, okay, uh, let me give you the answer on three levels. One, if the market is allowed to fix itself, it's never happened that it never did. So there's no empirical evidence to back that. Secondly, a lot of the Austrian economics is what we call praxeology or axiomatic, uh, particularly George Reisman and Henry Hazlitt, they just go through logic and prove um, a situation to you without having to um, depend on empirical data, if that makes sense. Okay. And the third aspect is governments interfere in markets so much and so often, and we haven't had an economy without central banking, that it's very difficult um, to say the market you know, we know it wouldn't have failed if it was allowed to function. Um, but because of the interference, it, it um, increases um, the problem. Um, there's a particular term that the Austrians use. It's called cluster of errors. 
And what that means is if you have a range of businesses all doing their own thing, relying on price as the main indicator of information, there is no reason why these bunch of people, these various entrepreneurs, big and small and medium-sized businesses, all commit an error at the same time. There is no reason for that kind of astounding correlation. Because they're not even communicating with each other. They, they're doing their own thing. You're doing plywood boards and someone else building aeroplanes, someone else doing you know, traffic signals, accounting software. You're not even talking to each other. Why is there a cluster of errors? Why does everybody go down? Like in, any individual business can make a mistake. No doubt about that. But that's not a market, that's not a systemic market failure. Yeah? I was looking into an article about HFC recently, and I wonder... So HFC? A high frequency... Trading? Yeah. Okay. So I was wondering um, if this has better of uh, the GFC or exports now. No, I mean, uh, as far as I know, high frequency trading did get the blame for st the stock market crash. And again, I don't think that was a fair blame. Again, it was a bubble created by lose money that eventually burst. Uh, but as far as this credit crisis, it wasn't the stock market followed the credit crisis. The credit crisis happened first. Lehman went down. In a bank market froze. Stock market fell. Um, so um, even the conventional media hasn't blamed high frequency trading. Uh, it's not so much high frequency as some of the trading uh, element was inbuilt put options. If you, if you have a put, the way to cover a put is to sell the stock if it's a naked put. And if you put in rules, like below a certain level I'll sell, that sort of thing, instead of buy, it's not logical. Um, the correct investment pattern should be I'd buy it alone. But if you had rules that cascade on itself, sometimes you can end up with a particular stock or stocks cascading down. But at that time, the smart guys, private equity and hedge funds would be picking it up if the fundamentals don't justify it. So high frequency trading, if it causes a problem, it becomes an opportunity for somebody else. It, it cannot be a problem. Any other questions? No? That's good. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Uh, thanks for everyone for attending. Uh